Welcome everybody from around the world, wherever you may be watching. Today I am stoked to have uh, Aaron Hurst from Imperative with me. Um, Aaron is a widely recognised social entrepreneur and authority on social innovation and public-private uh, partnerships. But I think the main reason I wanted to speak to Aaron today is because he, um, I've been following Aaron for a while, and he is a real a thought leader when it comes to uh, finding purpose and knowing what your purpose is. And I think, well, I know a lot of you out there are struggling with purpose. So one of the things I recommend that you do after you listen to Aaron, get, you know, get away, you know, all your distractions, put them away, all your browsers, social media, put them away. After that, go across to imperative.com and do a self-assessment. I really recommend you do that because that, for me um, and for many other people, will be the starting point of really finding your purpose and finding a career path that really suits you. So, uh, Aaron, welcome and thank you for joining me this morning. No, it's thrilled to be here. Uh, any chance to talk purpose, I'm all over it. And uh, I love what you're doing. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Aaron, what I wanted just to start out doing is... Um, you know, there's some people I'm sure in the UK, US who may not know you. So could you just start out by telling us a bit about you, your your career path and how you got to the point you are now? Yeah, sure. No, happy to. I, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, been uh, an entrepreneur for, uh, I think my first venture was, venture probably a bit of a uh, stretch, but first uh, entrepreneurial activity was when I was 16 um, and went to the University of Michigan in the US and studied service learning. So the whole process of how do you learn from helping others? Mm -hmm. And then went on and worked in the nonprofit sector for a couple uh, for for a while, um, and realized that nonprofit organizations struggled to be able to have access to the same marketing technology, HR, et cetera, as companies. So I went to Silicon Valley and worked for five years in socially oriented uh, tech companies, and really came to understand how those functions work in a scaling, thriving business. And decided out of that that we needed to find a way to have every nonprofit able to access these incredible services, marketing, tech, et cetera. And uh, started the Taproot Foundation, which over 12 years built out a global movement around pro bono service, having people working in business, donating their professional skills to help nonprofits in need. Um, across the US, we were able to build a market of about $15 billion a year in pro bono services and then affiliates all around the world. And, you know, I think the story takes a turn there because I realized with these tens of thousands of professionals um, that uh, it was, it was this is so much more rewarding than my day job, my paycheck job. And at first I thought that was an incredible success, right? We had been able to create something that was so rewarding for folks. But then I came to realize that it was just a supplement. It was uh, addressing a need they had that they weren't getting fulfilled by work and realized that the bigger challenge was how do we fix work itself? And have been on a journey since leaving Taproot for the last couple of years with Imperative to figure out how do we make all work feel like pro bono work. And it's been a wonderful experience. It's working with amazing millennials, uh, working with uh, experts in academia, with leading entrepreneurs, trying to really figure out how do we fundamentally fix work at an organizational level, but more importantly, at an individual level. Because the more research we did, we realized you create purpose for yourself. Um, and we got to stop expecting someone to just hand us purpose as if it was something that was a benefit. Sure. And I think uh, as well, it sounds as though purpose has been really embedded in your in your career. It's something that, you know, um, in my, what, 15, 20 years in, in recruitment, um, yeah. many people start by looking for the functional aspects and the skills related aspects of their career. It sounds like you've you've done it differently from from a very early part of your career is that right yeah i mean i think it's a um i think it's interesting I think there's a couple of different aspects to it i think there's a question of what you look for and there's just how you show up right um and for some people like their craft is where they get purpose and that's very much tied to a function because their craft is so important to them think of a musician think of an artist uh certain professions where uh the craft is at the core i think for most of us though uh we could apply purpose to so many different things um, and it's more for me always been about finding interesting challenges um, and working with awesome people um, and finding opportunities to grow and when I've seen those things I haven't thought twice I just jump in and I think that the purpose oriented work with 
are like problems that I think are worth solving and where am I going to get stretched and do work that I'm not sure I can actually do and be stretched to really grow as a person. Um, and I think it's that approach to work uh, more than that. I worked in the nonprofit sector or for profit. I don't think that matters as much as just approaching work with that mindset of not looking at it in terms of title or comp, but looking at it in terms of those relationships, impact and growth opportunities. Why do you think it is? I mean, so for me, this is like a logical way of looking at it in terms of um, being happy, being, you know, finding meaningful work. It's not sure. going to be logical to everybody. And again, my experiences of de not only dealing with individuals, but dealing with, I don't know, other recruiters or dealing with um, some of the business schools, some of the university careers services. Yeah, sure. Why is it that this is not part and parcel, do you think, of, of the, the way that they educate, you know, their graduates and postgrads? Yeah, I think a lot of it is tied to sort of the norm of what a professional means. And I think over time, like through the industrial economy and information economy, we've gotten to the point where we want people to play functions and roles. Um, and we want them to be predictable resources. The whole idea of a human resource leads to a mindset of what resource are you for me? And the more I can peg you, the easier it is to put you into an assembly line, whether that's a literal assembly line or whether it's a white collar assembly line. But knowing what you represent and being able to represent that in some kind of a function or a skill makes you a predictable resource. And what professional is is basically a predictable resource. A professional is someone who can do the same thing 10 times and it'll have the same outcome 10 times, right? Whereas an amateur is someone who does those 10 things and maybe three times it works out, seven times it doesn't. But that's sort of been the norm of our educational system and business community is how do we get people to be predictable? How do we predict this? How do we build efficiency? Instead of how do we empower and enable people to be their best? Um, predictability is more valuable or is perceived to be more valuable. So. Uh, that's where a lot of the emphasis has been. So the push for educating kids around skills, about finding people based on skills, is all about a need to build an efficiency um, for which um, it really crushes the soul. Um, and it ultimately limits the upside for a lot of employees. It does give you some predictability, but a lot of the predictability is negative predictability, low engagement, high turnover, et cetera. So we sort of engineered the soul out of work. Um, and higher education education is as much the fault for that as anybody for falling into this trap of skills and educating to a job description instead of educating to be amazing human beings. And talking about that engagement, I mean, there's so many statistics being bandied about in terms of lack of engagement um, sure. at, at work and that lack of engagement being linked to happiness, et cetera. And sure. what, I mean, I don't like blaming, I don't like putting blame on people, but how, where is that, do you think that lack of engagement, other than obviously not finding work of your purpose, but where is that lack of engagement come from and how do we, how can we overcome it? Would you say, or how, yeah. how can we? Sure. I mean, first of all, I think engagement's a really uh, old school, ineffective measure in general because it's a fundamentally paternalistic model. Um, it's a basic idea. There's management and labor and that management needs to engage labor mm -hmm. um, because otherwise they're not going to be, you know, satisfied their job. They're not going to stay in their job. I would never say to you as a friend, Alex, like, I really want to engage you. You'd be like, screw you. Like, I don't need to be engaged. <laughs> right? Like, you don't say that to someone as your peer. You might want to say, like, I want to empower you. I want to support you. I want to enable you to thrive. But I would never say I want to engage you. Like, that's not something <laughs> you would say to a peer. So the whole fundamental model has this paternalistic sort of approach to it. And it's also very passive, like being engaged or not. Um, if you look, though, at the sources of that, it really hasn't changed for 20 years since they started measuring it. Um, you know, I think it's a number of things. But a big part of it is a lot of people are not psychologically wired to be engaged. Um, they fundamentally have such incredible fears um, they have fears about um, being rejected. They have fears around their self-worth. They have fears around being taken advantage of. And those fears that are largely created in your childhood prevent them from ever being authentic at work and fully think it's okay to be them because they assume if they're themselves, they'll be rejected. Uh, they assume if they're themselves, they'll somehow do something inappropriate. Um, they assume that if they're themselves, they'll somehow not be valued. Um, and that fundamental fear just gets in the way of people's ability to uh, be engaged and uh, to be empowered. And what we're finding in our research is there's just a really big difference between people psychologically. Um, and that the first step for people is they've got to work through, if they're not engaged or fulfilled at work, they probably are playing mind games with themselves that are preventing themselves from actually being fulfilled. And they're making it someone else's responsibility, not their own. That's not to say there aren't 
jobs that are horrible in a lot of ways. There aren't managers who are horrible. Um, but at the end of the day, like I always bring up Victor Frankl, who was a famous psychologist and writer who was a slave in concentration camp in Nazi Germany and found fulfillment out of that experience. So to me, that points to the fact that even in the worst job, worst situation, um, you still make a choice about how you react. And that's a big part of what separates humans from other animals is our ability to choose how we react to stimulus. Um, and until you take ownership for that, you'll always feel a victim. And you get caught in that victim's wheel. So that's where I think a lot of this stems from. Sure. And when we talk about, uh, well, let's not use the, the, the term engagement then, you know, it's, finding... It's <laughs> finding, hard to avoid. It's been so ingrained in our language. It is, it is. I mean, fulfillment is, is, a, is, a, is an important thing. And it's interesting what you say about you can find that purpose in almost anything. And I think... Um, over the years, I mean, even my mom and her grand, grand, you know, her mom, for example, I'm sure there were points where they were trying to find purpose in, in their work. But for them, it was more about, you know, job and money, you know, being the, yeah. you know, the breadwinners, etc. of the family. But um, I think and it seems as though there, there seems to be, I fast forwarded a little bit, but it seems as though there's sure. a, a real um, momentum now, a real sort of shift in terms of uh i suppose what you could call the millennial generation and even my, even my generation gen you know uh, in terms of finding work that is is perhaps or at least uh well, not finding but unlocking and leashing something that's within you i yeah. guess is what you're saying um to to have something that's more meaningful what do you think's driving it in terms of that the, the shift that is uh seems to be happening at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, that's a lot of what my book, The Purpose Economy, is about. Is basically, if you look at um, why economies shift over time, it really aligns with uh, evolution and the fact that we as a species, like every species, want to have a higher quality of life and we want to live longer, right? Very basic needs. And we have, over the last you know, hundreds and thousands of years, done a lot to hack our environment to be able to have a higher quality of life and to live longer, um, at least for a lot of people. And you know, as you look at what's sort of the next thing we can do to improve quality of life and lifespan, I mean, the research is pretty clear that people who work, with, work and live with that sense of purpose um, do have longer lifespans. Um, they do have a higher level of fulfillment. So I think there's a fundamental biological need there. Um, and it's turned into a fear where you hear a lot of millennials, and this is true other generations as well, but a lot of millennials that are sort of economic, like the ones who are leading the labor force, the ones that are leading consumption, they're less scared about where am I going to sleep tonight, you know, where am I going to get fed. They're worried about a life without meaning. They're worried about not mattering. Um, so it's not just a survival mindset. There's sort of this next level order of magnitude issue, um, which can be explained I think, very clearly from a biological standpoint in terms of why they're wanting that. Um, and it is leading to massive disruption in labor and in consumption, um, as you see people making that a higher priority and not being as interested in consumption, not being as interested in status, um, and more interested in the things that they see as increasing their quality of life and lifespan. And you, you made a reference there to uh, the, the book that you wrote, The Purpose Economy, yeah. and the fact that it, 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 I suppose it charts the different different stages of sure. of you know, that, that evolution. Could you just talk me a bit, a bit more behind why you, why you, uh, you, you expressed it in that way in terms of, you know, I know you've done a lot of research, but um, is there something that you discovered, which, which you wanted to share, I guess? Yeah. I mean, it's a journey. I don't think it's like a major, like aha moment. Like I just got struck by lightning, but uh, my uncle, when he was an economist at Stanford coined the term information economy back in the seventies and proved in a dissertation that we had moved from an industrial to an information-based economy. And I always found that really interesting that um, how macroeconomics shift at the most macro sense of the word, right? And uh, as I was looking at his work and talking to him, I was realizing that running the Taproot Foundation, um, the economy had changed radically from 2001 when I started Taproot to when I left Taproot a couple of years ago, where um, we were seeing the innovations that were happening in the marketplace being really different. We're seeing millennials making very different decisions. And it really mirrored what I saw in his work around 
the signs he saw that the economy fundamentally was shifting. These weren't just like random acts, right? Um, and this is the way evolution generally works. Like if you see in nature, you know, one tree that looks a little funny or one frog that's a little different, you're just like, oh, that's just a freak, right? Mm -hmm. But if you see the majority of trees looking different, if you see the majority of frogs looking different, you know a biological event has occurred. And what I was seeing was enough change that made me think there's a, something more fundamental, like a biological um, um, event that occurred where we were fundamentally shifting our priorities. Um, and I saw so many people working it, and they didn't connect the dots. So to me, the inspiration for the book was seeing all these frogs and trees everywhere changing and that people were treating them as isolated events. Like, oh, it's just, you know, we're in the tree business. We'll talk about that. Oh, we're in the frog business. I'm like, no, don't you see that you're all part of something bigger going on here? And recognize that if we all come together and see that, we can help chart the course uh, to make the most of it instead of treating these all as disparate uh, changes. Sure. And the purpose of we're, I guess what you're saying now is that we're in the in the purpose economy. How, how are things going to be different for us um, in terms of or how do you think things will change over the course of the this particular period, this particular shift? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we're still in the information economy. I think we're in the purpose economy is emerging, and I'm sensing, based on what I see in the data, we're probably five to ten years from it becoming the dominant economy, um, where it actually drives you know the core GDP, core innovation. Um, we're sort of at that nearing that tipping point, point. and the previous economies stick around. Like the agrarian economy is still there in the sense that we all eat, right? Um, the industrial economy is still part of what enables so much of the information economy. So they coexist. It's a question of what dominates. Um, I think what we're going to see is a real transformation of cities. Uh, cities are where a lot of this activity is happening and the blurring of uh, different cultures, different uh, pockets of cities, um, and a real transformation there. We've done a bunch of work around cities um, at Imperative. We're going to see careers look a lot different. Um, for example, I think in the U.S. predicting by... Uh, 20, 20, 40 percent of people will be uh, freelancers. Uh, so we're seeing much more mobile workforce, a much more fluid, uh, much less loyalty to a brand, a much more like loyalty to a meaning. And the majority, one of the things that really separates freelancers from other folks is they are even more purpose oriented and get more out of their work than others. I think also pushes it that way. Um, we're seeing products and services radically change. I was just on a cruise ship, which I never thought I would do in my life, um, but it was a purpose cruise. We were going to um, go on a cruise to learn about ourselves and then do volunteer work in the Dominican Republic. And I went on with my daughter and, you know, Carnival Cruise Lines, the largest cruise line in the world was like, we know this, you know, fundamental difference in what our customers want now. And just having big casinos on boats, um, isn't cutting it for everyone. And there's a fundamental need to change, to create a product that's about purpose. And we're seeing that across every industry. So, um, there's a lot more in the book, but those are some like little flavors. And from these trends as well. Aaron, um, you mentioned a lot more freelancers, for example. That's that's something that I'm, you know, doing more and more these days myself. Are there any other trends that uh, that could, I suppose, translate into opportunities that you foresee at all? I think there's opportunities in every direction. I mean, first of all, purpose-oriented people were showing in data outperform money and status-oriented people by a large margin. Um, so people who are purpose-oriented are going to be the ones that are in highest demand. They're the ones that employers are going to be looking for. I mean, one of our businesses now at Imperative is screening candidates on whether or not they're purpose-oriented because employers see the data and they see how much better purpose-oriented hires are. So you're going to see a fundamental shift there. And I think those that can help cultivate, recruit, screen, develop purpose-oriented people in the workforce are going to have a huge opportunity. Um, people who are great at helping foster relationships um, between people and create products that are around relationships. And then people are just yearning to grow. So I think the whole, in any industry that's around personal growth, um, I think is going to become even you know stronger in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, you're going to also see a lot around sort of impact and around city transformation. So I think there's a lot of opportunities around that as well. And I think, well, that, that falls into my category in terms of, you know, the, the uh... you're, in, you're in luck. Yeah, well, I hope so. I hope so. I, you know, I hope, hope I'm riding the wave. I hope I will be at least anyway. Um, but there's still a lot of, uh, I suppose, there's lots of uh, confusion still around what purpose is, you know, finding your purpose, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think it's just uh, you wake up one morning and then all of a sudden something just falls onto your lap or it just it just strikes you from from nowhere. 
that wasn't really my that was my experience my experience was more you know i i feel i suppose i feel great meaning in, in terms of helping people to get to get by in terms of you know finding fulfilling work yeah. themselves what i suppose what then is because i think you categorize purpose into into three stra or yeah you categorize purpose into three or four different strands could you talk me through that please uh, aaron yeah, I think there's context. I mean, what we found is a lot of people think purpose is a noun in the sense that, you know, you have a cause, you have something that's your purpose. And we're finding that that's really not what drives fulfillment. That's not also very predictable. Um, what really matters is more the verb, sort of how you go about your work. And that's where we've really been able to do the research to figure out there are these three drivers or three areas of drivers that define um, what you're going to get fulfillment from and that people have a pretty different psychological need for purpose. Um, I'll give you one example, which is uh, we call the who driver. Who is it that you want to see work make an impact on, right? And there's three different elevations, and it's remarkable. I mean, you see this just in our – we've had over 60,000 people do this, and it's amazing how even the distribution is. Because I think in nature, there's a natural need for balance between these things. There's not – I don't think it's a coincidence that the distribution is so even. Um, at the bottom elevation, and at bottom does not mean inferior, but just at the ground level, what you have are people who really need to see their work directly make an impact on the street. They need to be able to help a person, a group of people. They need to see the direct impact on an individual's life to feel like their work really matters. Right? So I think about the doctor who sees a patient, right? And they see that patient and like they get so much reward from just seeing that patient helped, right? Um, I am not that type. If I was a doctor, I joke, after I saw the second person with the flu, I'd be like, I've already seen two flu, that's enough. Like, what else do you got for me? Um, that's not where I get impact, it's not at that individual level. It's nice, it's not like I get nothing from it, but it's not like what really gets me up in the morning. The next is organizational. So it's people who really get purpose from saying, hey, look, it's great that there's doctors, but you know, my hospital, we've got 100 doctors. I want to help them all become more successful. I want them to help serve more patients, be more effective. How can we make this whole system, this team come together to be high performing and high impact, right? Um, incredible role. It's the hospital administrator. But to a doctor, they're like paper pushers, right? Like why go into healthcare to push paper? And the administrator is like, why be a doctor and help you know, 10 patients a day when you can help the whole hospital be effective? And the top level is society, which is equivalent of like a health care policy advocate, someone who says, you know what, it's great that there's doctors, great there's all these hospitals, but until we do the research to find solutions for cancer, HIV, malaria, whatever it is, right, until we have equal access, until health care outcomes are improved, like we need to work on those issues and we need to figure out how to help the whole systemic uh, discussion. So people tend to fall into one of three buckets and it really helps dictate two things, which jobs are the best fit for you, right? Um, and then secondarily, whatever job you're in, how do you cognitively connect your work to what matters to you? So even if I'm a doctor and I'm at that organizational level, I can still, if I cognitively know that, I can help figure out how do I make my team better? How can I give inputs into making the hospital better? I can still do things as a doctor to enable me to thrive. Or if I'm a doctor and I'm at a societal level, like I can still contribute to the field of medicine. I can contribute to research. I can do things that help make a difference there. Um, but what I hear a lot when you talk to a you know a doctor, a teacher, someone who's at that ground level, if they're not individually motivated, they have to do a lot of work to be able to cognitively still feel impact and not get burnt out. Yeah, and I think you, motivation. Yeah, it's 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 a big thing. It's a big uh, component of whether you want to find a, a a job or you want to find a um, work with 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 purpose or that that's meaningful to you. So, How Alex, is that? I'm curious for you. Which of those levels do you think you are? Individual, organizational, or societal? I think I'm at an individual level, Yeah, I'd say. Um, if I've understood you correctly, I'm at a point where uh, I, I... I did your assessment as well. I'm at a point where yeah. I feel as though I want to, I suppose, make a, gr a ground-level impact. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I want to help individuals i guess as well in terms yep. of making impact yep. and i think that's where i see you know that the whole it probably sounds a bit uh, cliche but the whole element of give a man a fish type yep. scenario where i feel as though i can build use the skills that i have to help people become more confident to help them become more productive to help them you know to become more uh, i suppose attuned to to what's around them 
and help them thrive in that in that way. And that's that's what I've done. Yeah. That's what my career has been all about so far. Although oh. I prob- probably went about it without realizing it, you know. Well, if you, you listen to yourself and you listen to your reaction to the world, you tend to chart a good course. Whereas if you listen to what everybody else tells you what you should do or what the opportunities are um, that you know are being put in front of you, instead of listening to like what you're reacting to, what you're drawn to. Um, you go off course, but it sounds like you've listened to your heart, you've listened to who you are, um, and you've you know taken that path, which is I think that is the way to be courageous, but it's also the way to have the most impact and be most successful. Yeah, and I think it, that whole element of listening to myself was something I, I didn't do for about what fifteen years of my well ten years of my career. I just thought, okay, yeah. I need a job. Um, you know, yeah. I need to pay the bills. Let me take this job or, you know, I want to work with these these particular clients because they're really prestigious people to work with. I didn't really yeah. <laughs> didn't necessarily think about, you know, the impact I can make at an individual level. So, you know, yeah. it's it's no, it's really safe. To, it's safe to do that. Right. Where, you know, OK, it's a high paying job. That means I must be successful or it's a well-known brand. So I must be successful or it's a high level title. I must be successful. And the challenge with those paths is you fast forward 10, 20, 30 years and you have a midlife crisis because you realize money and status aren't things that really matter all that much once you've got that baseline covered. Um, so it's sort of you're on a, you go on that path, you're on a path to a midlife crisis um, because you're not following sort of who you are at your core. I think I went very close to, you know, go, <laughs> going that di- direction in terms of the crisis. Um, you know, it was just, uh, I mean, we talk about it's not necessarily a light light bulb moment, but for me, in some ways, it was a a realization. I, I knew I knew what I was doing was was good, but I probably didn't really understand the importance, or I didn't really sort of everything was just washing over me. I suppose in yeah. my day to day work, rather than me being really sort of engaged in what I was doing, and really trying to find. And I suppose when you when you find or when you at least un- unlock what you're passionate about and what you're what's really you know of purpose to you, you begin to enjoy work so much more because you can you can actually you're actually present in what you're doing. Yep. You know. And that's the key because there's no the job is not as important as what's going on for you, and you can be in the most amazing job in the world and be completely checked out and disengaged and not fulfilled. Aaron, are you still there? Um, I'm losing you, Aaron. Most of it to be live front. As again, I think that's kind of look out. Did that break up? Uh-oh. Are you, you still there? I am still here. Aha! Uh-huh. You're back now. Uh, here. I lost um, you for about ten seconds there. Okay. No worries. <laughs> Um, no, I was just saying, I think that's the key is like, no matter how good or bad the job is, if you show up every day and you realize that each minute you're making that choice about how you're living your life, that's what really matters. Definitely. Definitely. Before you go, uh, Aaron, can I just ask, because I mean, to me, this is, still, I think it's something I'm still learning as well. And I think other people are still learning. How How can you actually generate purpose in work? Because... There are people who are, you know, they may be happy with elements of their job, but they still want to, there's still more that they can actually do. They feel that like they can do to, to, you know, feel more of that fulfillment. How can you actually generate purpose? Yeah, I, mean, I think one is just practicing gratitude and not always striving for what's next, but actually appreciating what's in front of you. And to think about the people you work with, for example, because relationships are the most important thing in work when it comes to fulfillment. And think about what you appreciate about the people around you, the people you get to work with, and who are the people you want to spend more time with, engage with more. Um, That's sort of one of the most important things you can possibly do is just appreciate who's around you and find ways to deepen those relationships. Um, That alone will make a huge difference. Um, I think the other thing, like you said, is you never stop learning. So it's every day finding something that you can do that stretches you outside your comfort zone. That'll make a huge difference. And then just constantly asking yourself, why am I doing something? And making sure you're clear on how what you're doing makes a difference to someone else. And if you're doing work that doesn't help anyone, and it doesn't have to be helping them in some like romanticized huge way, but just even making their day a little bit better. If you feel like you're doing work that nobody cares about and it doesn't impact anyone's life in any way, um, figure out how to fix that. 
those are the things. And I think you already gave the great advice of going to imperative and, you know, using our diagnostic can really help you start to um, have a North star. So anytime you feel like yourself getting untethered, you can sort of go to that and say, okay, that's what matters. Let me refocus on that. Excellent. Excellent. By the way, Aaron, do you have to go now? Is it, do you have to shoot off? Yeah, I need a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We started late. Um, no worries. Bit of a misunderstanding. Sorry about that. But no I just worries. wanted to say thank you for, for the time no, thank you. that you've given. I no, really appreciate it. No, if you're ever out in this part of the world, let me know. Definitely. Definitely. Just very, very, very quickly. What, yeah. what are your, what plans have you got? You know, what, what, where can we see you? You've got any talks lined up, et cetera? coming up yeah we're doing yeah i do talks and keynotes probably once a week different places all around the world um do a lot of uh trainings we're uh we're really looking now to start training people on how to be experts in purpose so they can go out and work at their companies and with their clients around this um and really train them on the methodology and process so starting in september we're going to have a week-long intensive course every month for anyone interested in uh, becoming a certified you know, imperative trainer and coach. Um, so realizing that I can only travel so much, so trying to really build out that network of amazing people who can help bring this and help people find their way. Interesting, okay, <laughs> very interesting. So. Well, and they can find, people can find that at imperative.com. So as I said, I rec recommend you go and see that. Brilliant. Amen. Cool. Thank you so much, Aaron. Oh, thank you. All really the best. Appreciate it.